hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So in this video, I wanna talk about medical decision-making as it relates to when people come back, like when to tell them to come back, when to follow up in the context of being a newer clinician, but also giving the example of hypertension management because I tried to talk about it without a clinical context and it didn't really quite make sense. So this is a combination of both things and it's very high level hypertension management because I can definitely get into pharmacology and that management, but that's definitely like a separate topic because it's really, it's a lot. So in this video, I'm gonna give you uh, an example of hypertension management, various different scenarios of cases, and the general frameworks and rules that I use for, for following up with patients and knowing when to have them follow up. So the example I wanna start with is somebody with hypertension, of course, I've already said that, but somebody who, like how I approach when to have people follow up. And the general rule, if there's a quote unquote rule, this is also the way that I approach medicine. Basically for every, like when we're in school, we learn the foundations, right? The foundations of like the core of what we need to know. But our jobs as new clinicians is to understand like what's in this big bubble of primary care. What are those threads for each of those little tiny origin stories in the beginning, right? Of hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Following those threads in terms of the algorithms, the management, et cetera, et cetera. And then like what is outside the scope of primary care into specialty care, into the hospital setting, you know? So we start with that, but we have to we have to build and build. So the short answer of knowing when to follow up with somebody is dependent, it depends, which is not helpful, right? But it's really dependent on the condition that you're looking at. But the other potential pearl that you can apply, the framework that I use is when I'm learning, going from those foundations to those following those threads into like the full depth of what I need to know in primary care, I'm really looking at, looking at it from the perspective of each condition. What is the worst case scenario? and what is the best case scenario. And this ties into when to follow up with somebody because when you understand the best case and worst case scenario for the condition that you're looking at, it will give you a sense of that spectrum of how soon to see them again. And there's a lot of philosophy of practice and a lot of clinical decision-making involved here, so it's not simple. It's not a simple thing, unfortunately, but hopefully these examples will illustrate what I'm talking about and help you translate that into your own practice and also identify your own philosophy of practice, right? Because we all have our own philosophies of what we feel comfortable with and not, regardless of how much experience we have, right? I hope to identify these a little bit more clearly, but um, anyway, if you're already, if you're a student or if you're already in practice, you probably have seen how different providers do things a little bit differently despite having the same guidelines, right? So anyway, getting into the example. So somebody, for example, has hypertension, right? They come to you in your clinic and their blood pressure is 150 over 90. Say it's a, you know, 50 year old um, cis male patient, right? There's a couple things you wanna think about. When it comes to hypertension, what is the worst case scenario? So the worst case scenario of hypertension is hypertensive urgency emergency, where your blood pressure is so high, it's causing end organ damage, right? So heart attack, stroke, you know, it's it, you're assessing for the signs and symptoms of end organ damage. You're looking at fundoscopy, which is challenging, but do they have any papilledema? Do they have a headache, vision change, uh, vision changes, chest pain, uh, dizziness? Like, do they have any signs of like neuro, cardiac, end organ damage, right? Because it's not the number that's the problem, it's the effects of the problem, uh, the effects of the number that are the problem, right? So that's the worst case scenario. So the best case scenario is somebody has hypertension. For example, one option of a best case scenario is somebody who has hypertension, taking one medication, taking it every day, and their blood pressure has been the same over the last like three years on that same medication. And they're exercising, they're following a healthy DASH diet or similar healthy diet, Mediterranean diet, et cetera. And they come to their appointments regularly. We see them once a year, maybe twice a year, but usually once a year for those stable, like well-managed hypertension patients. So that's the spectrum here, right? So when it comes to deciding when to follow up, it's inside of that context, right? So I, for example, I have somebody whose blood pressure is 150 over 90. Depending on the guidelines that you're looking at, and they've been a little bit updated and contentious, the JNC8 guidelines compared to the newer ones that are not fully adopted by everybody yet, the range of what the quote unquote goal is is different, right? But regardless, 150 over 90 is not in anybody's goal, regardless of what we're talking about. Say 160 over 90, right? So this is not at goal. So the, there's a couple pieces here in terms of the follow-up and the management, right? So it's kind of two pieces in this video. So one is like, where does this person fall on the spectrum of like best case scenario to worst case scenario? 
this patient is not quite at the place of worst case scenario, right? Because hypertensive urgency emergency is typically around 200 over 120, something like that, and then they're having all those symptoms, right? So this patient, we're assessing, do you have any signs of hypertensive urgency, right? You're asking all of those clinical signs and symptoms. If they're fine, then we're not really at that place, right? We still need to act. We still need to do something for them. And so the, de the decision of when to follow up is what you decide to do. So let's, let's take a pause there for a second and talk about hypertension. So when it comes to hypertension, assessment and management, you're looking at a couple of things. Are you taking, how often are you taking your medications? How often do you remember to take your medications? I personally love phrasing the question that way because it's less, there's less judgment, less risk of judgment when somebody answers that question because we all forget, right? I think we assume that everyone, you know, is prescribed a med and then they take it every day, but that's that's not real life, right? So how often do you remember to take your medications, right? Are you, what kind of exercise are you doing? What other data do we have? What is the heart rate? What is the blood pressure? Um, what is their BMI? Because we know that higher BMI, uh, BMIs over 25 are, can be associated with higher blood pressure as a potential risk factor. What kind of exercise are they doing? What is their diet like? Do they check their blood pressure at home, right? Because with hypertension, they can have this like kind of quote unquote white coat hypertension where it's only high when they're in the clinic, but then it's lower when they're at home. And if they check their blood pressure at home, how are they measuring it, right? Are they doing a wrist cuff? Are they doing an arm cuff? What times of day? Are they like sitting with their feet on the floor, which is the way that we're supposed to be measuring it, right? When they're in the clinic, have you measured it the correct way? Is it the correct cuff size, right? There's a lot of things to think about and assess. And I say that all because that whatever the assessment is of like what you feel like is contributing to the high blood pressure that day will influence when you decide to have them come back in addition to how close they are to the hypertensive urgency situation, right? So for this patient, they gained 10 pounds since you last saw them a, a year ago. And previous to that time, all their blood pressures are 130 over 80 or 120 over 70. They always check their blood pressure at home. Um, they just stopped because they felt like it was controlled for so long or well managed for so long. So they may have gained some weight with COVID and quarantine. You have a conversation about, hey, can we talk about body weight? I noticed that your weight is 10 pounds higher than it was before. And we know that that can contribute to elevated blood pressure. So I'm wondering if that's contributing to what's going on with your blood pressure today. After I've already assessed with them those other questions, how often are you taking your medications? What are you taking, et cetera, et cetera. So for that example of that particular patient, they're taking their medications. They're very concerned about their high blood pressure. And we have that conversation and they're like, you know what? I'd much rather, I'm going to pause there for a second. When you're the clinician, if you have something in front of you, there's some sort of intervention you're doing, right? And it doesn't always have to be adding another medication. You're thinking about all the options, right? So you talk about the options with the patient. Do you want to um, think about lifestyle modification? Do you want to think about attempting some weight loss? Do you want to think about um, medication adherence, reminders. Do you want to take another medication instead because your life is too crazy right now to even think about attempting to lose weight because you're just keeping your head above water, right? Because we're still in the pandemic at the time of recording of this video. There's a lot of thinking going on here. There's a lot to manage. This is also highlighting why it's so hard to be a new clinician, right? There's a lot going on here that I'm rattling off because I've been in practice for several years and I've done this like a thousand million times, right? So let's go back to like when to follow up, right? putting these both together. So you have this conversation with this patient, you come up with an intervention of some kind, right? Potential interventions depending on your patient and depending on the history you've gathered so far. This particular scenario, this person is more interested in bringing their weight back to where it used to be 10 pounds ago than they are with taking a new medication, right? So there's a menu of options here, right? So what we can do is give that a try. Um, I typically recommend for patients that we monitor their blood pressure at home with a cuff if they can afford it. If they can't, then that's okay. And have them follow up in a couple of months, right? Because how, number one, how close are they to the urgency situation? Not that close. What scenario in hypertension is going to make this person's blood pressure go from 150 all the way up to 100 over 220, or 220 over 100, right? That's not that likely. Anything is possible in medicine, right? Which is why I always conclude my visits talking about alarm signs and symptoms. Like, hey, I asked you about all of these things. Please watch out for those things. If you experience any of those things, please let us know. Headache, chest pain, vision changes, like like severe headaches, like things like that. Check your blood pressure if you notice those things, if you have a cuff at home or just let us know, right? So the likelihood of them going from the kind of like middle range of best case scenario to worst case scenario, it's unlikely for this clinical situation for them to skyrocket up to 200 over 100 or whatever and have, have hypertensive urgency. So for that patient, lifestyle intervention is gonna take some time, right? So I'm not gonna see them next week. I'm not gonna see them in a month. I'm probably gonna wait until three months, right? Because it's slightly above the, the goal range 
The intervention is gonna take some time. They know the alarm signs and symptoms. However, the caveat I wanna make here is that you are your own clinician and you get to decide, right? Because when I was a new grad, the thought of waiting three months to see somebody again felt like a lifetime. And I was like, are they gonna even make it, right? And which is, which is a silly thing to say because the situations I was looking at were not severe situations where that was even an option. But I was so nervous as a new clinician, I wanted to see everybody tomorrow, you know? So you kind of have to just make that decision for yourself. The reason, so let's just turn that situation a little bit, right? So if this person who has hypertension comes in with a blood pressure of 200 over 100, talking about that range, she is, he or she, I guess I'm pick, sticking with the same person, he, is closer to that hypertensive urgency situation. This literally happened to me last week. The person comes in, has this alarming blood pressure. I'm asking those same history questions. I'm looking at the trends over time. This person has always had, quote unquote, always had high blood pressure, doesn't check their blood pressure at home, and has no signs and symptoms of hypertensive urgency. We've done an EKG. We've assessed for all of the things that we're looking for. They feel fine and this might be a little bit contentious, but the evidence supports that we don't need to send somebody to the ER with that blood pressure just because of the blood pressure, because we don't chase down blood pressures urgently unless they have signs of hypertensive urgency, right? So for this patient, I'm really uncomfortable, but I don't need to send them to the ER because I've seen it enough times that they don't do anything there, aside from do an EKG and assess for the signs of endormic organ damage. And if I don't feel comfortable assessing that, then I'll send them, right? But if I've assessed them and I feel comfortable with that, we're just gonna manage them, right? But the follow-up is a lot closer, right? Because this person is a lot closer to the worst case scenario and it could change quickly, right? Because it might just be a few points until she gets, he or she, I'm thinking of another patient which is a she, so I keep saying she, but um, until he feels, until he doesn't feel well. But we're gonna choose an intervention and we're going to choose a quickly acting intervention because we want to get that down sooner, right? We don't have to chase it down right now, right? Again, then maybe that's a separate video to talk about hypertensive urgency and, and emergency and all that, but whatever intervention you choose, typically some sort of medication management, um, you're gonna see them a little bit sooner. And it depends on the half-life of the medication that you're talking about. It depends on a couple of different things, but there's no hard and fast, you have to see them tomorrow. You have to see them the next day. My comfort is that they check their blood pressure at home. Again, if they can afford a blood pressure cuff, which is wild that insurance does not cover these, but anyway, that's neither here nor there, but they check their blood pressure at home and I see them within a week. Maybe they check in with the nurses in two days or three days and they check their blood pressure there. They check their blood pressure at home. Um, and we've done some sort of intervention to, to bring it closer to the lower level, right? And then I guess one last thing I wanna say, um, that's like the general gist of hypertension management and in the context, and maybe it's not completely covering all the different options as it comes to hypertension. That's the kind of like quick and dirty way to approach hypertension management aside from the guidelines and meds and all that stuff. Um, but that's like the general approach as I take to um, when to tell people to come back, advise them, recommend that they come back because they're adults, they get to choose not to if they don't want to. But like just, just very briefly thinking, switching it to a different scenario, talking about cellulitis. So I have a video about cellulitis I can link to down below this video. That clinical situation is potentially different, right? The risks are different. The the rate and the of of progression to the worst case scenario is a little bit more rapid potentially than somebody with long-standing chronic hypertension. So if I'm really, depending on, again on the risk factors and the assessment that you're doing, but if they have diabetes, they're at higher risk for spread of infection, they're at higher risk for osteomyelitis, I'm gonna do a little bit of a tighter overseeing and management of that person. I might see them the next day or two days later or three days later knowing that for it to show complete resolution can take some time, but I do wanna make sure that it's not progressive, right? I wanna make sure that any antibiotics I start for somebody with cellulitis, number one is appropriate, right? Depending on their history and the risk factors and all that stuff, and then making sure that they don't need to go to the ER, but if they're appropriate to be an outpatient, I'm probably gonna outline the wound on their leg and I'm gonna have them come back in the next day or two days and then kind of follow them a little bit more closely. But anyway, if there's one kind of like takeaway that you can take in terms of when to follow up with patients is just doing your best to identify in the clinical situation, what is the absolute worst case scenario? How close are they to that? How would I know? And what is the likelihood that they're rapidly going to progress to that? How quickly would they rapidly progress to that depending on that condition and kind of working your way backwards. So alternatively, you can just ask. So that's what I did a lot of the time when I was a new grad. So um, hopefully this clarifies uh, some questions about when to have patients follow up and like the general like real world translation of one particular 
scenario, like we learn about things in school that like we learn about hypertension management, but like what does it actually look like in real in the real world, right? And so hopefully those two things were helpful today. Um, if you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. You'll also get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and bonuses that I really just don't share anywhere else. Anyway, let me know what questions you have. Thank you so very much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.